Okay, friends. So, um, without any further ado, I want to begin the Q&A for tonight. Um, without any particular order, I'll start with the first question here. Um, so, the question is as follows. Can you please explain if the series of blowing the shofar during Rosh Hashanah are the same as the conclusion of Yom Kippur services? Mm -hmm. Specifically, if the sequence of Tekiya, Shavarim, Teruah sound are the same at Yom Kippur after Neila. So it's true. There are two times in which we blow the shofar. One is Rosh Hashanah. One is at the conclusion of services on Yom Kippur. They are the same, maybe technically they are the same sounds. You do have indeed the Tekiya, Shavarim, Teruah at the end of Yom Kippur too. But essentially, they are very, very different. On Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar for mainly two reasons. Number one, for uh, to awaken us to do Teshuvah, as Maimonides writes very clearly, that sound is like an alarm clock, alarm clock for the soul. Where have I been? Am I going in the right direction in life? What do I need to rectify? How can I make my year the best year yet for me, for, my, for the fulfillment of my purpose? That's, that's reason number one why we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. Reason number two is to crown God as the king. The Kabbalists teach that that on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, God is having almost second thought, so to speak. Maybe I shouldn't be ruling this world. It has maybe disappointed me again. And on Rosh Hashanah, part of the prayer is called Malchuyot because that's when we got, beg God, please be our king. We want you. We can't be without you. Mm -hmm. So we crown God as the king, as kings in the world are crowned. How are they crowned? With trumpets, with uh, you know, a whole parade. Year two, we parade the streets and we blow our trumpet, which is the shofar. So that's the reason, really, why we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. I mean, there are other reasons, but those are the two essential ones. The reason we blow the shofar at the end of Yom Kippur is a whole different reason. And that's because at the end of Yom Kippur, we are sounding a sound of victory. Just like when armies come back from war and they want to show that they won, they go and blow the trumpets then also to announce to the people, we've won. So too, at the end of Yom Kippur, the shofar is a sound of victory, and we, which we say to God, look, we've won over the evil inclination. We are going to dedicate ourselves completely to the good inclination. And in general also, we've won over all of these prosecutors in heaven who didn't want to give us a good year, who wanted you to issue all the bad decrees. We know we won. We know that together with you, God, you, we will be blessed with the best year yet indeed. So that's the reason we blow the shofar at the end of Yom Kippur. <clears throat> Technically, the sounds are different, but essentially they stand for different reasons. Another little difference is that on Rosh Hashanah, in order to fulfill, on, uh, so on Rosh Hashanah, it is a mitzvah to hear the shofar. And uh, that's the mitzvah of the day. Really, there's no other real mitzvah. There are many customs, like dipping your apple in the honey and wishing each other a shana tova and so on. But the mitzvah is blowing the shofar. This year, we are only uh, blowing the second day because Shabbat calls us to the teshuvah. So we don't need that alarm clock on Shabbat. And therefore, there's no blowing the shofar on Shabbat. But at, uh, on the second day, on Sunday, there will be the blowing of the shofar. But again, it's a mitzvah to listen to the shofar on Rosh, on Rosh Hashanah. At the end of Yom Kippur, it's only a custom. It's not a must. If you didn't listen to the shofar at the end of Yom Kippur, yes, you missed out on an intensely spiritual experience, but still, you didn't miss a mitzvah. Now, because of that also, there are more sounds on Rosh Hashanah. On Rosh Hashanah, technically, one should listen to 100 sounds of the shofar. On Yom Kippur, there's only 30 at the end of Yom Kippur. But uh, that's the other difference between Rosh Hashanah's uh, shofar blowing and Yom Kippur shofar blowing. That's that question. Next question. Um, so, uh, dear Rabbi, it's my birthday this weekend, but I've always felt funny about celebrating it. My birthday was a bit of an accident. My parents said I was a surprise and I was born six weeks premature. Is there any meaning in celebrating the day that I wasn't really supposed to have been born? So, um, Okay, so I'm going to quote the Lubavitcher Rebbe, one of my favorite quotes, who says that the day you're born is the day God decided that the world cannot exist without you. There are 7 billion people indeed in the world. 
but every single one of us was born for a different purpose. Yes, we have the same Jewish soul, all of us, same one, one soul. We all come from the same source, but we have different purposes. My purpose is not the same as anyone's purpose here as, as it is with you. Your purpose is not the same as anyone here or anyone in the world. There are 7 billion people, 7 billion different purposes. If God created you, means that God needs you to fulfill your purpose. And there's no one out of the 7 billion that, that is like you, that can fulfill their purpose instead of you because you're unique. And therefore your purpose is also unique. Even identical twins are not completely identical. They too are unique. They're unique in their personality. They're unique in the way they look and also unique in the way they have to fulfill a purpose. So going back to your question, it's my birthday this week, but is there really a reason to celebrate this birthday because you weren't supposed to be born? So whatever your parents may say, they can say. Whatever your, uh, uh, your date of birth was, six weeks premature, that could be. But the fact is that God gave you a life, not just then, but also today. Each and every day we wake up in the morning. Some people don't. We wake up in the morning because God trusts us to fulfill our purpose today. And we can fulfill our purpose today like no one else is. I didn't meet the same people you met today. That's already a different side. So maybe uh, had an impact to make on these people. And you had an impact to make on the people you met today. And, and I can go on and on and on, but we have different opportunities every day, different uh, uh, context of times every day. And it's our duty to fulfill that purpose because God gave us a whole new day today. He made us again, wake up in the morning. And now, and on the bigger scale, he made you be born. So whether it was six weeks premature, whether your parents said it's accident, at the end of the day, you're here, thank God, in this world. And if that's the case, it's again because as the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, that the world cannot exist without you. Otherwise, God really wouldn't have made you be born. Before. But the God cannot, ex the world cannot exist without you. So absolutely, there's a reason in celebrating your birthday. But I'm going to go one step further. The question is how you celebrate. If you celebrate by saying, by tapping yourself on the shoulders, like many people say, and say, hi, I'm great. And therefore, I need a cake with as many candles and with as uh, much chocolate as possible. <laughs> Fine. You can celebrate like that. No problem. But that's not the Jewish way of celebrating. The Jewish way of celebrating a birthday is really asking the big question. So if I was born for a certain purpose, am I fulfilling that purpose? If God decided that the world cannot exist with, without me and therefore he made me come here, <clears throat> am I really fulfilling the reason for which God created me? That's the way we should be celebrating. A day of... of of uh, one's birthday is a day of tremendous introspection. Speaking of Rabbi Steinsaltz, I remember how I had the immense privilege of, of celebrating his birthday. He hated birthdays because those questions, those thoughts, in a way kind of depressed him. And he would tell us each and every birthday that those are the questions that one needs to ask during his birthday. But when he asks himself those questions, he feels like he, he's almost wasting his time. Now, if he feels that way, a man who accomplished so much and never slept, to dedicate himself to the Jewish people, to making Jewish knowledge accessible to all, then how should we feel? But again, that's, that's the, the way we celebrate Jewish birthdays, asking that big question. So celebrate your birthday, celebrate the fact that you're unique, celebrate the fact that your purpose is unique, but at the same time, ask the question of, am I fulfilling that unique purpose? for which God created me, for which God thought the world cannot exist without me. That's the way to celebrate birthdays. Okay, next question. Um, I had a question here and it was it's gone. So, oh, there we go. Uh, so, dear Rabbi, as we know, we have a group of CBT ladies in WhatsApp saying Tehillim every day. I have been uh, doing research and found out that every day of the month has a special Tehillim. When did this custom start? So that's a great question. So there are indeed uh, many Tehillims that actually show that division. Now, Tehillim, of course, I'm referring to the Book of Psalms. And by the way, it's beautiful that the CBT ladies have this group going on because as the Tzemach Tzedek, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe would say, that if we knew the power of saying those verses of Psalms as a supplication to God, then we would say Tehillim all day long because Tehillim burst the gates of heaven open, I'm quoting almost verbatim, reach the highest highs and make uh, God 
um, uh, fulfill all of our prayers. That's the power of Tehillim. So it's really beautiful that you say this on behalf of our community and of course on behalf of the Jewish people in the world. And I'm sure your Tehillim has immense effect on high. But um, the, speaking of the divisions, yes, I would encourage everyone to do that. I personally do that. I say Tehillim every day best, based on the way the Tehillim is divided. So because we have sometimes 29 days uh, in the Hebrew months or sometimes 30 days in the Hebrew months, you would end up saying the whole Tehillim in either 29 days or in 30 days. But it's divided into really 30 sections. And what you do if it's a 29-day month is that on the 29th, you say section 29 and section 30 on the same day. So basically, you'd be finishing again the whole Tehillim in one month. Most Tehillims, including Rabbi Stelz's uh, Tehillim that is out in Hebrew, but it will be coming out in English soon, it has... Uh, it, ha it has those divisions. And you can see, you say more or less about, what, seven psalms a day, something like that. I don't know, do the math. 150 psalms altogether divided by 30 is five, right? Mm -hmm. So five psalms, it's about an average of five psalms a day then. Some have more, some have less, depending on the length of the tehillim of the, of the chapter itself. But yes, definitely, again, I would encourage everyone to adopt this custom because as mentioned, it really, really shakes the heavens, literally, and fulfills our prayers. All right. Um, Rabbi, next question. Yes. Rabbi, I have a question about that. Yes, um, There's certain, there are certain to, to, to fill in that I love saying. Yeah. And I, have, I can't go to sleep without saying them, even though they're the same. It, it, <clears throat> Is that okay in the no, that's set? Absolutely I mean, I feel right. like it, let me, there's let me, no way I can go to sleep without saying Very that. good. Excellent. By the way, in the bedtime Shema, there's, there are two tailings, Psalm 121 and Psalm yeah, 51 the, that are okay. recited. But okay. I will say this, that, that of course, the book of Tehillim uh, has, King David wrote each Tehillim with a different intention. And therefore, every Tehillim really is crafted to fulfill a certain prayer. So for example, 121 that we just mentioned, is a Tehillim that is, um, is, is crafted really to, to in, in times of suffering, in times of sorrow. Yeah. Um, tehillim number 20 is more or less the same. Then you have Tehillim that are for good occasions, like the hallelujahs in the end from 145 to 150 yeah. and, and many other occasions. So you're right. Every Tehillim is its own, its okay. own purpose, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, friends, this is the last... Uh, question I received this week, and this is an opportunity again to remind you, please send more and more questions. We'll open this, us, uh, this up to more questions after this question. But this is how it goes. Dear Rabbi, um, skipping a few lines. All right. As you know, I've been searching for a good Jewish husband for quite some time. So I have to ask you, why does it seem like all of the good Jewish husbands are already taken? <laughs> so, Rabbi Bayalus, can I so, can I tell you a joke? It's such so, a parking lot. All the yeah. parking spots are gone except. Well, for I disagree. Parking. Right, I understand the joke, but I fully disagree. So I'm, I want to clarify a few <laughs> things. Number one, you never know, as we said last week, you never know what happens behind closed doors. They may seem good to you on the outside. Maybe they're not as good as you seem. But secondly, I'll tell you why. Uh, very simply, kabbalistically, spiritually speaking, but also practically speaking, because Jewish husbands have found their halves. And therefore, they're wholesome. So the non-Jewish, the, sorry, the Jewish husbands that are not taken yet are halves. You see them as halves, justifiably. The, Jew, the husbands that are taken are wholesome, a whole. Anything that's whole seems better. A picture seems better in a frame. Um, a couch seems better when it's well positioned in the lounge. It, it, when it comes together, when it comes together with its other half, it seems better. Absolutely. So I would say this. So what's the solution? Start looking at yourself as a half and start looking at available Jewish men as halves too. And then figure out which half fits your half instead of figuring out which wholesome fits mine. Wholesome and half don't go together. Mm -hmm. Try to figure out which half fits your half. See yourself as a half though. Don't think you're wholesome. See yourself as a half. And then figure out who's that half that will complete your half. But that's the reason why all these Jewish husbands that are already taken are, are seem better because they're wholesome. 
Now, how can you figure out who fits your half? I've said this already in the past. I think you need three measuring sticks. Measuring stick number one is see if you can find someone with common goals. I think that's tremendously important. Common goals technically and common goals spiritually. For example, do you want to live in Phoenix? Do you want to live in Israel? Or do you want to live in New Zealand? Because if you have two different places where you live, that's, that's not a common goal. That's going to create conflict. Spiritually speaking, what type of home do you want to, do you want to really run? Where, where do you want to send your children when you eventually have children? To Jewish schools, non-Jewish schools? What type of Jewish schools? You, you need common goals almost on every subject in life. That's number one. Number two, I think you need common values. Uh, and again, that's why uh, you have to ask those questions. Are you going to celebrate Shabbat at home? Are you going to keep kosher at home? Are you going to go to synagogue? Are you people that study Torah? Are you going to go to classes together? Are you going to... You, common values. And number three, I think you also need a click, an attraction. There's a reason why we are attracted to some people more than others, because they belong to that pool of halves that we potentially can click with. But you need a click. You need to be what's, what's called in Hebrew, Meshichat Alev. You need to have an attraction of the heart. Now, I'll add to that what Rabbi Steinles adds to that, and that is that you also need, if possible, it's not as important as the first three, but you also need common interests. I think that men and women, as he puts it, men and women is, are different enough that you don't need to add more differences if you don't have to. So if you both like sports, if you both like, I don't know, uh, fancy restaurants, or if you both like uh, playing bingo together, whatever it may be, then it can really certainly help the flow of the relationship. So common interests also help. But again, they're not as important as the first three, which are common goals, common values, and that Mashiachat Alev, that attraction of the heart. <clears throat> That's how you can start finding your other half. All right, friends, as mentioned, so this is, uh, these are the questions I received this week. 